Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Hello, my name is Susie Cross and I'm coming to Gladwell next summer with my family for a holiday. Do you need help with accommodation options? No, thank you. A friend has offered us her holiday house for two weeks, so we will be staying there. I'd like to know if there are any restaurants in the area. It's my husband's birthday while we're there and I'd like to celebrate it. Gladwell has 12 restaurants, which are all excellent. It just depends on what type of dining experience you're looking for. For example, three of the restaurants specialize in seafood. You read my mind. As it is a coastal town, I thought that would be the best option. Can you tell me a bit about the restaurants? The house we are going to stay in on is on Ocean View Drive. It would be really useful if we were able to walk to and from the restaurant. What is the number of the house? All three restaurants are close to Ocean Drive, but it is quite long. It's number 42. So, are you up the northern end of town? What a lovely spot. It's very close to the Dunbar. If you walk towards the town centre from the house, it's on the cross street, going up the hill. It's probably about a ten-minute walk. Or you could catch a taxi. Anyway, the food is quite fancy. The chef has won lots of awards and people come to town particularly to go to this restaurant. You would have to book well in advance. Price-wise, it is on the expensive side and is about £100 per head. That's good to know. I don't really mind if it's on the expensive side, as long as I'm prepared for it. We are saving so much on accommodation that we can afford to splash out a bit when we eat out. It would be nice to live it up for a couple of weeks. You mentioned two other restaurants? Yes, another one is the catch of the day. It's a more family-friendly restaurant in the centre of town. It is on the main promenade, so you can catch a bus directly there in about five minutes. Keep in mind, though, that buses stop at midnight and it would be a long walk home, so I suggest a taxi. The restaurant will be able to call one for you. The food there is excellent, but more your basic fish and chips and salad type fare. A full meal with dessert will be about £40 per person. They cater for groups there, and there is musical entertainment. It's a fun place, but can be a bit on the noisy side if you are looking for a quiet evening. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. I think we're looking for something a bit more intimate. There's nothing worse than not being able to hear each other because of loud music or noisy customers. The Dunbar is starting to sound like the best option. The third option is an Italian seafood restaurant called Giovanna's. I love Italian food. Where is the restaurant? It's in an old building at the port in the old part of town, very close to where the fishing boats come in every day. The bus takes about 10 minutes. Is it child-friendly? I've got two little ones, aged six and eight. Absolutely. Children are welcome. This might be just the place for you. A three-course meal costs about £50 a head. I can assure you personally that the food is delicious. I eat there myself quite frequently. The staff are very friendly and give good advice about what to choose from the menu. And there is a child's menu available. 
Another thing, if you are celebrating a birthday, you can order a cake from them to come out at dessert with candles. You don't want to be baking a birthday cake while you are on a holiday, do you? Giovanna's is one of Gladwell's oldest restaurants and has been run by the same family for about 50 years. Giovanna was the original chef, but I think her daughter is in charge of the kitchen these days. The restaurant is quite tiny. It only seats about 50 people. Well, all this is food for thought. I have to have a think about what kind of evening we want. Thank you very much for your advice. It was a pleasure. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a man called Christian Jackson, staff coordinator of a trade fair facility, showing a new employee a map of the facility. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Hello, Josephine. My name is Christian Jackson, and as you are starting work at the trade fair today, I'd like to show you around the area you're going to be working in. Let's look at this map first. You can see that this is the entrance here where you have just come in, and where we are standing now at the information booth is adjacent to it. This will be the main area that you will be working in from 9 o'clock today. As you know, this week the trade fair is the toy fair and you will be expected to be able to direct people to any part of the fair they wish to go to. If you are unsure about anything while giving information, make sure to ask other members of staff. Giving the correct information is your main focus. You have an hour and a half between now and nine o'clock. So that should be a good amount of time to have a good walk around and get yourself familiar with the place. I don't think you'll find it too difficult to work out where everything is. The trade fair is broken up into three main halls. To the left of the information booth here is the entrance to the Brooklyn Hall, which contains traditional toys like board games, dolls, stuffed toys and arts and crafts materials. You will also find model building kits and all the different building block brands. At the very back of the hall is the lecture theatre, where different companies will be giving presentations and launches all day. Opposite the information booth and across the floor of this main area is the Sanderson Hall. It is home to all the multimedia toys like video games, computer software and pretty much any electronic equipment. If you turn left when you enter Sanderson Hall, you will see the Wi-Fi zone, which has recharging facilities and Wi-Fi access. Next to the Wi-Fi room is the Internet Café, which is a good place for people to meet, have a coffee and use their computers. See how easy it is to remember so far? On the south wall of the main area, just over there, you can see the entrance to another hall, and next to that are the toilets. The south entrance goes into the Carmichael Hall, which has all the sports equipment, from running shoes to bicycles. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
There were plans to have each of the sporting groups, such as tennis and football, centralized and positioned together. But this made it too difficult for the companies that cater for more than one sport to know where to go, and companies didn't want to be placed right next to their competitors. So the stands are randomly placed. Therefore, it is important for you to remember the positions of the bigger sporting brands. On the south wall of the hall are meeting rooms for people to do deals. On the eastern wall, there is a self service restaurant and a large cafe with a seating area next to it. So, here is your map. You are expected to work until 5 pm and you can have a half hour break at some stage to have some lunch. We will give you a £10 voucher to use at the self service restaurant. Rosemary Jonas is in charge of the information booth today, so she will tell you when you can do that. Otherwise, you need to register at the information booth now and get your identification tags. You need to wear these around your neck at all times, and you can use this orange card to get through the turnstiles every day for the next nine days. As you know, because this is a short contract, you will not be paid penalties for working on Saturdays and Sundays, though we will pay you overtime if you have to work late any of the days. Here is a timesheet for you to fill in the hours you work every day, and you need to get this signed off each day by the person who is in charge of the information booth that day. Give it to me on the last day, but make sure you keep a copy to give to your employment agency. Do you have any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You hear two students, Oscar and Chloe, talking to their tutor about a study they have done on university sporting facilities. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Hello, Oscar and Chloe. For the facilities planning part of the course, you decided to do your project on the university swimming pool. What made you choose this? It is one of the most expensive sporting facilities at the university to run. The university has never actually done any kind of study or survey on swimming pool usage, so we thought it could be useful for the university itself to have some data. Is that so? Perhaps it is because there would never be any question of closing the pool, so they have never had to justify its use. That's true, but as it is so costly to run, they may wish to find a donor to help with upkeep. It is very run-down and probably needs a complete renovation. That's just our opinion, but it may be necessary to present possible donors with data in the future. You might be on to something there. The university could not get sponsorship from a sporting goods company or a large corporation that would not want to be associated with something that is not of high quality. We can talk about that in a moment. Firstly, how did you undertake your survey? Oscar and I spent a week at the pool asking questions to the users. We took it in turns and one of us was there all day. We asked people how often they came to the pool, for how long and what they did in the pool, and questions about the equipment and changing rooms. 
We have 600 completed surveys. It was difficult getting up to that number because the same people use the pool every day. So toward the end of the week, most of the people who came in were those who had already done the survey on earlier days. We really think we managed to interview nearly every swimmer. It's difficult to know because we only did head counts on the people that refused, but many of them agreed to participate in the survey on later days when they had more time. So, what were your basic findings? We estimate that around 600 individuals come to the pool each week. When multiple visits are taken into account, that's a total of 1,800 visits. The average swimmer comes three times a week and is in the pool for an hour. Peak times in the pool are between 6 and 8 in the morning and from 4 to 6 in the evening. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Tell me about what users were saying about the facilities. There were major complaints about the lack of or state of swimming equipment such as paddle boards and foam bars, etc. A lot of people were saying they were very old and mouldy and dirty. People were quite happy with the changing rooms, but felt that the hot water was a bit hit and miss on some days, and the pressure was often really weak. There were requests for more secure lockers and more power points. People need to recharge their phones and use hair dryers. There were also some concerns about new rules for personal trainers, that they would have to start paying the university to be able to coach swimmers at the pool. As most of them are students and staff of the university, they felt this was unfair. The university is worried that outside trainers are taking advantage of the facilities. I was unaware this included students and staff as well. What other information did you get? The members of the diving club have heard a rumour that the diving boards are going to be taken away. Apparently, the insurance costs to the pool for having diving boards have risen enormously after some compensation cases in diving accidents at other public pools. We asked the university administration about this, and they couldn't confirm or deny whether it was happening. I don't know anything about that, but I suggest you investigate it further and include it in your report. We definitely intend to do that. Another thing we want to add to our report is the lack of staff who are monitoring the pool. We observed many times over the week when there were some times of the day when there was only one member of staff, or sometimes even nobody, standing by in case there was an emergency. And even more worryingly, there seems to be no emergency protocol in place, nor is it standard procedure for any of the staff to have done a first aid course. Of course, this was not data from our survey, but we think it is an issue that needs to be confronted and we want to include it in our report. I think you are both working very well on this. I suggest you continue and report all your findings. Come back to me next week with a draft report and we can go through it together. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about plastics. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
The word plastic means pliable and easily shaped, and only since last century has it been connected with synthetic polymers. Plastics are usually made using carbon atoms from fossil fuels. Synthetic polymers are repeating chains of atoms much longer than found in nature. These long chains give the polymers their strength and also make them lightweight and flexible. John Wesley Hyatt created the first synthetic polymer in 1869 by treating cotton fiber cellulose with camphor. It was a plastic substance that was inexpensive to produce, could be made into a variety of shapes and look like ivory, horn and tortoise shell. It was proclaimed as the saviour of the elephant and the tortoise. Leo Bakeland invented Bakelite in 1907 as an insulator, just as buildings were becoming electrified. It was an improvement on celluloid because of its resistance to heat and could be used for mass-produced products. Chemical companies started to create other types of polymers, such as nylon in 1935 and plexiglass in 1933. Both were used during the Second World War, and though it ended, the plastics industry still continued to grow. The 1950s were filled with new plastic products, and they were considered an inexpensive, safe, clean substance that pointed to a utopian future. In product after product, in every industry, plastic began to replace traditional materials. In the 1960s, the first plastic debris was seen in the oceans, and though there were some environmental concerns, the reliance on plastic continued until it became virtually impossible to avoid plastic in every part of life. Packaging, clothing, construction materials, kitchen utensils, baggage, shoes, and most of all, bottles were all made of polymers. In the 1970s, anxiety about waste and the use of fossil fuels grew. Plastic was of particular concern because it was not biodegradable. Plastic became a word that meant something was cheap or fake and then superficial. In the 1980s, the plastics industry introduced recycling as a solution. Many municipalities collected plastic as part of their waste management services. However, a minute proportion of waste plastic was collected and much of it still ended up in landfill or the environment, particularly in developing countries that were increasing their use of plastic but did not have the systems in place to recycle it. The symbol of plastic pollution is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is an area the size of France that is a swirling, deep mass of plastics in the sea. Governments are now making attempts to curtail plastics use, banning certain products like bean bags, plastic drinking stores and supermarket shopping bags. However, looking at a typical weekly shop from a supermarket reveals that 99% of the plastics bought are supermarket products, rather than the shopping bags you carry at home in. There are also concerns about the threat that plastics might pose to human health. Apart from the fears for the environment about the toxic additives that are used in the production of plastics, such as bisphenol A, or BPA, and phthalates to make them more durable and transparent, there is also concern about the amount of plastics that we are ingesting. It is believed that minute particles of plastic in the human body can affect hormone reactions and may even be associated with autoimmune diseases. Little is known about what the actual effects are and what it might mean for future generations. Even though plastics are abhorred for their negative effects on the environment and human health, their use still continues to grow in the development of computers, mobile phones, medical products and other consumer goods which have played a big part in raising the standard of living around the world. They are cheap, light, safe strong and are good insulators. Many possessions that we have would not exist without the availability of plastic and it has replaced the use of animal materials such as ivory, leather, bone and fur and saved the felling of millions of trees. 
There is some hope to be found in more effective recycling programs and the development of bioplastics, which are made from plant products rather than fossil fuels, harking back to the early use of cellulose. The big hope for the future is that someone will soon come up with a sustainable, biodegradable alternative to plastic that will see plastics being used with great caution and only as a last resort. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.